Hello and welcome to this FS Tech webinar about smart data and the race to innovate, sponsored by MicroStrategy. I'm Hannah McGrath, editor of FS Tech, and today I'm joined by an expert panel to delve into the key challenges and possible solutions for financial services companies as they leverage data to drive personalization and keep up with the digital challenges. I'm delighted to say that today I'm joined by a panel of experts in this field. They are John Garvey, Global Financial Services Leader at PwC, Mark Jenkinson, Chief Operating Officer at Digital Bank Chetwood Financial, and Robert Davis, Vice President of Solution Management at MicroStrategy. So before we jump into their insights on this topic, I'd like to set the scene for our discussion. As demand for digital services grows, customer expectations are evolving rapidly, with mobile apps and online services critical to maintaining loyalty through rich personalized experiences driven by data and analytics. And while on-demand culture means that today's consumer wants real-time access to services at the touch of a button, many financial services providers have proven slow to unlock the value and insights in their data, creating an inertia among employees and customers that more agile competitors are only too happy to exploit. Progress in the race to innovate has also been closely aligned with the shift to cloud in recent years, with many institutions already stymied by legacy IT systems and cost constraints facing further challenges in the form of regulatory scrutiny and compliance requirements, which have delayed the move to more modern data architecture. As a result, some forward-looking firms are looking at agile data platforms that integrate with existing systems to connect disparate data sources and harness the potential of AI, machine learning, and automation, enabling them to play the fintech challenges at their own game. So in this webinar, our expert panel will explore the key challenges for financial services firms as they look to modernize their data strategies, roll out innovative products, and keep up with the competition. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into the questions for our discussion. And as we go through, I'll add a bit of context to the questions. Um, so our first question is, uh, how have financial services organizations adapted to meet rising demand for digital services and mobile applications? Uh, and for that, I'd first like to ask John from PwC. Um, thank you, Hannah. Happy to be here with you uh, all today. So uh, there are many ways that financial institutions are adopting you know, new digital services. Maybe I'll, I'll speak for around three top things that we see in the marketplace today. Sure. So number one, um, I, I would say that uh, a real focus on the customer and customer journey and to make, despite having uh, quite a history of legacy systems in many institutions, most institutions, to improve the customer experience from a digitization perspective. So that's number one, using you know, some of the modern tools that, that exist today that are well known. I'd say the second area is really around um, you know, making the digitization journey post the customer experience in terms of the customer interface. So whether it's a mortgage business introducing electronic signatures and an improved kind of process and workflow. And then maybe a third element, which is rapidly emerging uh, or some of the partnerships that these firms are joining up with cloud providers and other third parties to accelerate that journey. So we see that in the marketplace today, and you've seen many of the announcements of those partnerships uh, over the last uh, number of months in particular. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot a lot of change going on, particularly in the last 12 months, uh, a lot of uh, digital services sort of um, very much in demand on, on the financial services front, but across uh, many industries. And uh, and again, you know, the, the shift to cloud, as you mentioned, uh, enabling, um, you know, faster time to, to, to market and time to value. Um, so that's something that we're going to cover later on today. Thanks very much for that, John. Um, and Rob, what, what's your answer to that question? How have financial services organizations adapted to meet this rise for, for more digital services? Well, I'd echo a lot of the things that John just said. The most important thing is following the customer journey and understanding what customers want more of from your organization. You know, the thing that struck me, uh, especially during the pandemic, is companies really haven't come up with new digital transformation strategies. They've just accelerated strategies they already had. Everybody knew we were going to go to almost full online banking. Everybody knew we were going to have to provide more mobile access to clients to financial services. It's just those things are absolutely essential now in the, uh, in the environments where people can't go into a branch. But what I think is key 
is building a culture within financial services that is constantly trying to make little startups to figure out what to do with the data to give more value to customers. And I'm thinking of things like, how do you help customers who maybe have a credit card with your institution to understand how to optimize their payment schedule, given their challenges with cash flow or their challenges with, with overall debt? And what is the best way for them to harness that credit card to be a key player in their financial future? Same thing with loans, same thing with all of these services that banks and, and financial services companies are offering to, to customers today. It's really understanding that customer 360 and understanding how you can provide more value to that customer at time of contact in the mobile application or in the online banking application to give them more value from your institution. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's not enough anymore just to have a shiny interface, um, which looks modern and, and feels modern. You actually have to have the products and services which are built around that, which are personalized and, and make efficient use of data. Um, you know, otherwise, there are a lot of challenges out there who are prepared to, to you know, to, to compete with you um, for, for customers. Um, and I guess that, that moves us nicely on to our next question. I'm going to ask Mark. Um, Mark, what, what are the key challenges for financial services firms in integrating disparate data? Um, Rob talked there about sort of the 360 customer view. Um, you've obviously been instrumental in setting up um, your own challenger bank and, and banking services. Um, what, are, what are the key challenges um, in terms of getting that data together, consolidating it and making it into uh, or ready for, for new products and services? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, when, I, when I talk today, I'm going to talk in two modes almost, because one is 22 years as a consultant in professional services in FS. Uh, and the other is four and a half years um, playing with uh, building Chetwood uh, and finding and founding Chetwood. Um, so I've almost seen both perspectives of it. Uh, and a lot of that 22 years has been embedded into how we design it and uh, are building and executing against the Chetwood thing. Um, if I look back into my old world, then there's two main challenges. Banks have grown up and have challenges with the systems and the platforms they've been using over many years. And the solutions to those have changed through the decades almost. So it was about creating a common customer view, a single customer database. It was trying to pull everything into one place. And it was always a big movement of data to create a golden source of that data and then to tell the rest of the world where that golden source was. And we've spent millions, I've sold millions of those projects myself. <laughs> we have done and spent, and banks have spent a lot of time doing that. The, the thing that we've done with the new digital cloud-based tools is we've almost skipped all of that. We've said right at the beginning that when we bring in a customer, it's a digital customer from the beginning. The challenge when you've got a, a bank with a whole load of customers in, some of those customers joined through the branch. Some of those customers joined through filling in a paper form if it was a credit card. Some of them joined through a telephone. The digital footprint that you have of those people across those systems wasn't digital enough at those times. The advantage you have when you start in a digital era is everything is digital. Every interaction, every quote you make, every movement they make on their phone is digital and captured. And you don't have a legacy of people who weren't digital. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge advantage. Um, but right at the heart of Chetwood, we had to think about this from the beginning because we decided to be a multi-brand, multi-product bank from the beginning. So we have no concept of we own the customer because we gave them a current account or a transaction account. We don't have that. We're an open market bank. We give products out. We design products against customer segments, which are quite narrow compared to this universal banking approach. And that means you have to really focus on what that data models are going to be inside because you can sell products to individuals under different brands and they may not know that Chetwood is underneath that. But at the same time, you need to be aware of that. And that creates a whole set of challenges in terms of the use of that data, the expiry of that data and how you go about um, using sort of a lot of the modern day cloud-based tools to actually set that data structure up. And it's only through that that we've been able to build an organization that looks like Chetwood today. You couldn't do it with a holistic one brand, one transaction account, let's try and cross sell the products into it. Um, uh, and so it is that technology that's allowed us to be able to do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And re really interesting that you were saying there about sort of, you know, um, the the legacy, almost legacy customers, people who are mainly paper based. Um, and, and a lot of the data that, that banks hold about them are in very disparate sources and, you know, very diff different formats as well. Um, and, I, and I guess that's something that, you know, a lot of banks are struggling with at the moment. Obviously, there's been a huge shift to digital, but there are a lot of um, quite vulnerable customers out there, some of them who, who actually need support most at this time. And it's about how you reach them, given that a lot of focus is now shifting to digital channels. So I think that that's something also that financial services uh, institutions are thinking about. Um, John, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your take on that. You know, what, what are the key challenges that you're seeing in the market for integrating disparate data sources? Well, it, it's what Mark was saying about his, his life as a consultant, right? So, you know, the, if you look at your typical legacy institutions, as, as, as Mark alluded to, they were built up in many of them through product silos and also through different um, acquisition channels, right? So, so you have in your typical, you know, bank, for example, or insurer, you, you have people that, you know, have, have basically different levels of, of digital footprint, as Mark said, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the organization. So, so um, I think the interesting comment, uh, many amongst many that Mark, Mark made on this is, some of the newer technologies are saying basically, look, we don't have to put this data all in one place. We can actually basically, as long as you map where everything is, and, and frankly, the other aspect of this that, that maybe we haven't touched is the integration of, of data and information from outside the organization, right? And, and basically combining external um, data and insights, many of them, by the way, uh, you know, are, are being, many of those insights are being sold or, or that data is being sold by FinTech companies to financial institutions. And, and actually in a number of our clients, we're, we're working with them to generate some really interesting new insights by again, mining the data they have, but combining that and perhaps in some cases filling in the blanks um, with, um, with data that's sourced externally through social media and other means. Yeah, absolutely. So really interesting one there, you know, external data in the in the, the form of third party data, you know, external providers coming in and, and working alongside and um, but also, you know, taking from, from other publicly available sources. I think open source data is something that financial services institutions, you know, they have to be really careful about in terms of compliance and, and data privacy. And we'll talk about governance later on. Um, but it's a really interesting mix. It's not just your internal data. I think that's a really important point. Um, so how can uh, how can data visibility and analytics fuel faster development of innovative products and services? So once you've got your data in the right place, once you've consolidated it um, and it, it's not, you know, it's not in, in various places around the business, um, what can you then do with it in terms of visibility, in terms of sort of uh, looking at it on a platform and then drawing insights out of it using analytics? Um, Mark, um, how, how does analytics fuel faster development of products and services? Um I don't know, I guess I'm going to point to um, uh, probably our, our first product, LiveLend, is a really interesting case in data and analytics, because what we looked at with that, which looks like at, at, at one level, a, a standard unsecured, unsecured lending product, but we, we looked at something which was, how do we make that more dynamic? How do we use digital data to say, well, hang on, we can do something with this product which brings it to life. Um, a, a classic bank would want to sell you a loan for five years, pay you this and forget about you for five years. What we did with LiveLend was say, but you changed. You changed the day after, you changed the week after and increasingly the digital data and our knowing of you says we could do something with that. And I think this is where, this is, this is the future, this is where it's going to go. It's, it's how do we use the digital data on a dynamic basis, not just to um, not just to service it, not just to improve the app, but how do I change the product? Um, uh, and with LiveLend, and we did some really interesting stuff in, in, in customer research around this, but the improving credit score is a really interesting one because a lot of the decision you're making up front is around the credit score. And all we're saying is, well, if you can improve that over a period of time, why would we not reflect that in the product? 
Um, and that creates all sorts of dynamics in there. It creates a nudge behavior with the customer. It creates an affinity with that organization, with the brand that's done that. And it, and it sort of goes a long way to repairing, I think, one of the things that we saw when I spent my years in consulting was the trust breakdown that consumers had with banks. Um, and to start to think about it in that way around, we're using data, we're using analytics, we're using changing behavior. It's all done in a digital way. And we're giving something back to the customer. Uh, and, and some of those thinkings were right at the heart of when we set Chetwood up and built LiveLane to start with. That was uh, that was right at the heart of our, our thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think something that um, a lot of banks are now only just realizing is that customers are very aware of the fact that they're exchanging their data in return for something. But you have to make that transaction valuable to them. 100%. It has to improve their lives. It can't just be, I'm going to hand you my data. I'm going to let you know what I'm spending. I'm going to let you know, you know what I need to borrow. But I need to know that A, that's safe and B, something worthwhile is being done with it. Um, and I think that's that's only going to become a more pronounced problem in, in the coming years. Um, so, so Rob, um, what's your take on data visibility and analytics and, and, and how can they speed up the time to, to getting those products and services out to customers? So I echo a lot of what Mark just said. I take it a step farther in that the key is to get that data and analytics out to the front line of the financial services business, to get it out to the customer service representatives, to get it out to the digital equivalent of the teller now, so that people actually are in contact with that data when they call into the bank. And it goes to exactly what Mark said. How do you make that customer understand that them trading their data with you gets them better value? So it's, it's all about being able for the frontline person in the bank to be able to explain to the customer, if you sign up for this service or this product, we've shown that 90% of the people in your same financial situation will see an improvement in credit score over the next whatever, or will see a improvement in their ability to save over the next certain amount of time and really have that back and forth. But it also needs to be agile and, and supple in some way, in that recording the success of what's happening on the front line of the business and using that to refine the algorithms and the new products in your offering uh, is just as important. So when you're thinking about the analytics and the business intelligence that you provide to your frontline workers to help customers, you also need to think about the telemetry that you're recording on those customer interactions to see when things are working and when things aren't working. It's not good enough just to have analytics in the hands of the business analyst or the data scientist anymore. It needs to be in the hands of the people that are actually facing the customer and then to be able to collect the metadata on that so you can make proper decisions to help the customer even better. Yeah, absolutely. So, so sort of capturing almost customer feedback data, you know, in real time, making sure that it's actually working for them as they're using it rather than, you know, a yearly survey, which not many customers, you know, are, are that engaged with um, in, in many cases. And um, so, yeah, really interesting there point on telemetry. And I touched on the next question, um, which is for you, Rob, um, a, a bit earlier. It's about the, the demand for data sharing as part of a 360 degree view of the customer and their data, um, whilst also improving data governance. That, that's something that really is high on the agenda at the moment. Um, and uh, as I said, it's only become, going to become more pronounced in the coming years. Yeah, I mean, I sympathize with you, Mark. You know, I've been 20 years in the business intelligence industry too. So I know we all have this goal to have everything in the golden, perfect, uh, well-vetted data warehouse back in the days of Kimball and all the rest of it, right? But we've realized as we've graduated through uh, multi-dimensional data systems and data lakes that have now become data swamps and uh, all of the various iterations of trying to get to that single version of the truth, that maybe it's actually not attainable. And when you think about a customer 360, there's gonna be new things coming into a customer 360 all the time. It's not like you can define what a record set for a customer is today and expect even next week, that's gonna help you do your business. There's gonna be new bits of data you want to record that you want to have in there. So when we think about how do we combine agility and governance, which is always the yin and yang in, in, in business intelligence, it's all about building a core that's a single version of the truth across the data sets that you own, but then allowing a certain amount of agility so that you can see how adding new things to that customer view will help you serve the customer, will help profitability, will help the design of new products. 
And so it almost needs to be a marriage of governed, well-defined, certified data sources and the ability to go out and search for new data, bring new data into conjunction with that and do analysis on it. And that's both in the back end and the front end. So, you know, I'm still a, a huge proponent of semantic layers or semantic graphs or ways for you to leverage old data, new data, cloud data, data coming from third party sources and getting a single version that you can do analysis on. But also the ability to combine all of those data sources in customer facing or front end facing applications without having to build a single data warehouse. So being able to do just in time analysis that gives analytics to frontline workers that really matter. So again, I think it's a process, right? And it's a culture thing. Mm -hmm. You have to have to start from that core of a well-governed customer record and then have the ability to add to that, test new things that are coming from other data sources and over time add those to the lexicon of governed data within the customer. Ab absolutely. And that, that needs to be done, um, you know, not just efficiently, but also co in a compliant way. It needs to be done safely in accordance with the various rules and regulations that, that banks in particular are, are subject to. Uh, and that takes us on to our next question. Um, how are financial services firms tackling the demand for greater personalization um, with that data privacy expectation and, and, and sort of regulations like GDPR? Um, Mark, you know, how, how do you sort of make that balance between um, privacy and agility? I, I think this is a this is a huge area and one that's only going to grow tighter and tighter. And, and in part, I'm I'm glad I'm not in a large organisation trying to deal with something like this because the technology now is opening things up. The insights that we gain are, are huge, and the things that we can do with it, but we can't because the original contract I have with that customer isn't against that. The contract I have with them is for something more specific. And when we go check with them the multi-product thing, the contract is with the product. I will show you my name and address because you're going to give me something back. It's that exchange of value. It's true because I'm doing something with them. Once that loan has gone, I have no right to that data. I really have no right to it. I can't, I, I shouldn't get them in on a loan to go and sell. I'm going to sell you some services over here, which look like an insurance product over there because the tighter and tighter net on the data usage is only doing that. The knowledge we have is doing this. <laughs> And so you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to marry these two things up. And, and, and I think we are we're fortuitous in check with that. We can do it against the actual products that we have. And customers, you can keep true to that. I know what I'm doing when I'm taking a loan or opening a savings account. You're not doing anything else to me. You're just saying that's, what, that's the exchange of value. And I'll buy that. In fact, on the lending side, I'll offer up some more data if I'm going to get a better rate. Or you might say yes, where you'd say no. So the exchange of value thing is really important here. Now, the challenge you have if you follow a traditional business model, it says, I'll give you something for free, typically a transaction account, a current account, and then I'll sneak up and do something else to you. Well, hang on, you gave me a free product over here. Now you've changed the dynamic. You've changed everything about it. You've changed everything from how you talk to me, who you're about, why I'm coming into this, so we try to tackle, and we really did think hard about this at the beginning, is what is that, what is that relationship we have with the customer, and particularly the customer data? And it's one of, we're just borrowing it while we offer them a product. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, we I, I, and then we'll, we'll give it back. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really interesting, that idea of a, a kind of a data contract, as it were, um, even if it's not something that's explicitly stated, um, you know, it's something that consumers are becoming more aware of, and, and certainly banks should be, because, um, you know, and this, this relates to our next question as well, um, you know, financial services using data platforms to adapt to changing regulatory requirements, and obviously in the UK, um, you know, that that's something that uh, a lot of banks are looking at very, very closely, um, you know, post-Brexit, um, but, but John, I, I wonder what your take is on um, how data platforms are being used to adapt to changing regulations. Um, well, I, I think this goes back a bit to my previous point about um, more and more you, you see, I, I would call them almost data brokers, right? Um, and, and there's a, you know, when you integrate some of this external data into your analytics, into how you use it in your business, you need to do some due diligence to make sure that that who you're buying the data from is reputable, 
their processes that they're using to obtain that data, uh, et cetera. So I think you know, we're seeing this, these types of things starting to be integrated into third party vendor management um, processes in some of the bigger institutions. I'd say the other, the other thing which um, we're starting to see uh, some of the data groups within uh, the institutions is tackle a little bit of what Mark said, which is you know, um, some review on how data is being used and whether that's proper and whether um, you know, actually how that data is being employed, whether it's offers or pricing or, or whatever. Also, um, interestingly enough, these days, a, a bigger issue is around bias you know, does, does the use of certain data generate bias, um, you know, intentional or unintentional in lending decisions or, or other financial decisions? So that, that's another, that's, I mean, we could spend an entire probably, um, you know, webinar on that topic, but, but, but that, that's another kind of sensitivity on this point. So look, this is, this is, this is a growing issue as, was said by by both uh, of my other colleagues here, and uh, and and we're we're constantly seeing more and more requirements for transparency. Look, maybe one last comment: if you if you want to see how important this is, look at what's happening in China, uh, and and the new platform laws and things in China. Uh, a lot of what this uh, is driving this is the complaints and concerns of consumers around how their data is being gathered and, and used, particularly when someone owns a social media platform and uh, links that to a financial institution or vice versa, right? So, so these, these issues are very much front and center on the headlines today. And I think more and more, we're gonna see it happen uh, almost on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a fantastic point there, John. You know, we, we spend a lot of time at FS Tech writing about um, these changes in the market and the way in which, you know, it's it's just it's just becoming uh, a live issue with, you know, Facebook's development of Libra uh, and their digital currency. Um, there's also, you know, payments and plans to, to turn WhatsApp into a, a kind of payments and, and commerce platform. Um, so these things are changing extremely rapidly. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, you know, this this idea of um, the, the lending decisions and, you know, algorithmically driven decisions, which perhaps are a black box, there's not enough transparency around them. Um, and so, you know, having a data platform or, you know, some kind of technology um, which allows you to, to, to view that data and the decisions that are being taken with it, um, I think is something which is of extreme value, not just for the, the consumer, but also for the regulators. Um, so, yeah, really important point there. Um, I want to move on to our next question now, which is... Um, and this one, I think, Mark, you, you can probably um, look at from both sides of the coin. Um, what are the key challenges um, for financial services providers in improving time to market? Um, and how can the established players keep up with the speed and agility of the fintechs? You know, that we obviously spend a lot of time writing about uh, incumbents versus fintechs. But, you know, what, what are the advantages um, for fintechs in getting things out there on, onto the market? Um, I mean, that, they've all been sort of said before. And I, I'm certainly not one of these people that believe somehow that a fintech challenger is destroying something in the old world. They're just different businesses. Um, and you have to appreciate, and I, and I totally appreciate that. And um, one of the things that is in the massive favor of the scale organizations is money. They have a lot of money to throw at stuff. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not necessarily the case in some of the fintech worlds, but they can be more focused. Um, they are, we're faster at being able to knock out proof of concepts. A lot of the common services we've built allow that to happen. Um, you don't you don't get bogged down. You can try things out. You can rebuild something very quickly, and the governance layers to get that into a, into a place which is production and ready are just shorter. It's just it's a, it's a it's a it's an equation of a number of people in an organisation in many ways rather than than anything uh, too too clever in that sense. And and the legacy of the, the technologies being built with those common services in a way that we can all play and reuse them and do stuff with it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a big advocate of proof of concepts, allowing teams to develop stuff, uh, try it out, um, all, all the things you'll have heard before. And, and I know a lot of the large organizations have still continued to, or do build it in that way as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're just doing it on a, a much bigger scale across an organization. And I don't know, it, it can appear slower at times. I reckon there's some of those that are actually faster at some stuff. I think there's some really good examples out there of, of, of large organizations that are doing some good stuff. So I, I'm not in this world of 
destroy the big bank, the fintechs are going to win this and all that type of world, because I, I don't think it's true. Yeah, exactly. I I I, th I think you know, given sort of, uh, we do a lot of webinars and, and roundtables on these on these topics. Um, it surprises me how we've been talking about this for two to three years about the the fintechs coming in and stealing the the major banking providers' lunch, and it just hasn't happened yet for many reasons. But you know, there are compliance issues. If you don't have a huge compliance team, it, everything is gonna is going to be a bit more of a challenge. Um, and so that you know that I guess is a is a question for for fintechs, but also you know if you're working on legacy IT you can just build digital platforms on top of legacy IT systems um, and, and that's something that's happening a lot as well um, so yeah I, I agree with you I think um, it, it's not either or I think they're, they're working in parallel and doing and, and providing different things for consumers um, Rob what's your take on that you know what are the key challenges in improving time to market and, and how can the established players um, sort of emulate that speed whilst also do, very much doing their own thing so as Mark said, I think there's nothing preventing the established players from keeping up with FinTech. In fact, they have several advantages in terms of the breadth of data that they store, in terms of their breadth of experience in providing new solutions to market. I think a lot of it ends up being cultural within large institutions, and it's endemic of any large institution. Data gets siloed, departments own their own data, it's hard to share data across departments. And from a purely technology infrastructure point of view as well, established players have much more investment in on-premise, large, hard to move IT infrastructures that are difficult to uh, scale, first of all, difficult to make B 2 C applications in quickly, might be more difficult to provide mobile applications in. And so really it's, it's about creating that single version of the truth and that more broad data de dictionary and data definition across an organization, creating a culture where sharing data is accepted and where you almost have more of an internal startup mentality, where you start new product teams, even in a large organization that have a mandate to create a new product and are able to reach out and get new technology and new data from anywhere in the business. And I've seen this happen at a number of large established financial institutions, whereby creating an internal startup culture has actually allowed them to keep up with the fintechs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we, we've spoken to a, a number of financial institutions. You know, I can I can mention, um, I think StockGen is doing very much that model. They, they have a team, which is almost like a, a startup built within the bank, um, who are experimenting with things and doing exactly as Mark said, you know, testing proof of concept, doing things quickly, establishing if something doesn't work um, far faster um, than, than they perhaps would have been doing it if they were rolling it out um, to, to their entire customer base. So yeah, really interesting stuff going on there. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question now, which is about um, AI. AI and machine learning, um, how are they being used to improve the end user experience? And what are the key challenges to implementation? Uh, and for that, I'd like to go to John. So um, it's a great, it's a great question, Hannah. So look, the first, actually the first challenge um, that I'd like to perhaps mention here is regulatory. Mm -hmm. So um, actually what we're, <laughs> What we're finding is the minute that you use the word AI with a regulator or with a compliance group, as opposed to say the words analytics, um, it, it, it almost creates a big uh, a red flag mm -hmm. and subjects um, any development project, et cetera, to significantly greater scrutiny. And look, uh, I, I'm in the consulting business, so we love buzzwords and we love new things. And, and in fact, you know, we survive on, on new things without change. Uh, we wouldn't have a business. Right. So, but, and, and by the way, the tech industry is exactly the same way. Right. So, you know, the new buzz is AI in some respects, but AI, if you look at actually what a number of these things are actually doing, you know, they're, they're kind of sophisticated models and analytical engines that frankly, aren't that different from, algorithmic trading or, or other models which have been used in the financial services world for a long, long time. But it sounds a bit sexier to say AI, if you will. What, what's happening in a lot of cases is the minute it says AI, someone says AI, bam, you know, things stop. I mean, we've seen it. Uh, I, I mean, it's gotten to the point where I've cautioned people to say, look, if this isn't really AI, don't call it AI. Right. Um, because you, you're, you're going to, you know, 
you're, you're going to basically cause yourself unnecessary complications. So, so I think, I think that's, that's maybe, you know, one point. The other point is really, <clears throat> you know, the, and, and we're doing a lot of work with people around something called um, citizen led uh, development. So that's actually the, the, one of the issues is the IT department's capacity to basically build these things and, and addressing that in terms of shifting some of the more mundane automation and, and analytical work from the IT department to trained users who are using you know, these low code, no code tools, whether it's Power BI or Tableau or UiPath or, or things like that. Um, actually a key thing uh, that, that we see institutions doing and we're doing a lot of work in this area helping them shift that burden so you can free up the IT resources to work on the more um, complex technical challenges, whether it's AI, cloud migration or transformation, so. Yeah, absolutely. Really interesting points there. Thanks for that, John. And, and really interesting as well that uh, despite the buzzwords often being the currency uh, of, of tech firms and, and financial services at the moment. Um, actually, because regulators aren't ready, they, they simply don't have the infrastructure in place to deal with a lot of uh, you know, AI-driven processes. Um, it's slowing a lot of that, that down and it's actually raising, as you said, red flags, compliance issues. Um, and and, and I, in fact, a lot of, in a lot of cases, um, people that I've spoken to have said, we call this AI, but it's actually just robotic process automation. It's, it's taking a manual time task uh, and, and, you know, basically putting a very basic algorithm on it and making it happen mm -hmm. several times and much more efficiently. Um, AI in the sense of human-like intelligence and machine learning, um, I actually don't think there are huge amounts of really widespread applications for that in the financial services sector at the moment. And it's a really interesting space to see how quickly people have the impression that that's happening and how much is actually happening on the ground. Um, so, Mark, I wonder, do you have a take on that? You know, AI and machine learning, um, are they improving end user experience? You know, are you, are you guys using them or are you using, as, as we mentioned and has, as John mentioned, you know, this uh, uh, sort of peripheral versions of these technologies? Yeah, I think, I think, I, I think about three spaces, I guess. Um, one, I won't go into detail because I am not a rocket scientist, but if you talk to our chief data scientists and the people in Checkwood, then they'll talk about explainable AI as they're building scorecards uh, and they can get quite nerdy and get into that with, with you. But I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, and, and two other areas I see it really starting to, to work for us is digital collections. So how, how do I interact with somebody when I need to have that conversation with them? Gone is the pick up the phone, phone them and batter them. It's the interaction. People don't actually want to answer the phone. They want to chat to you. How do they want to chat to you? When do they want to chat to you? We've got to train the machine to understand the best way to interact with a customer when it's doing something like that service. And the other place that we use it a lot is in onboarding journeys. And in fact, all journeys. What, what, how do we improve the journey? How, how do I AB it? How do I do it quickly? How do I let the machine go? No, no, this is a better way of doing it. This is a better way of doing it. This explains it better to the customer. And, and so I think there, for me, two, two areas that we had to set ourselves up from the beginning to be able to do this. We are, we are behind the curve because we don't have those, we don't have those hundreds of years of data in effect to be able to, to build on top of and learn inside. We have to learn very quickly on what we've got today and try and pull in as much as we can, but it, it's light and we need, to, we need to use everything we can get as we go forward. And, and so when we set it up, you're thinking about how you're gonna do that from the beginning, not, not I'll do that project in five years time when we've got a load of data, you have to have it from the beginning. So there's an advantage there, but the velocity and the volume and variety of data needs to still continue to grow for us to learn and let the machines start to, to make really valuable uh, decisions from that. Absolutely. Yeah, really interesting there. And um, we, we heard from um, the FCA at one of our recent conferences, who said that the way they've got around that issue is just to get synthetic data sets um, and use them for a limited period of time, but make sure that the, the tools and products and services you're building with those um, are suited to scale up environments where mm -hmm. you can feasibly take actual customer data later on down the line. And um, because otherwise they're not going to be ready um, for, for what you actually need to use them for. So really interesting point there. Um, I want to move on to 
you, um, um, John mentioned this, and I think we've all um, touched upon uh, cloud um, and, and how that's changing uh, financial services, uh, sort of uh, data infrastructure uh, over, mm. over the past uh, few years. Um, how are organizations overcoming mm. the issue of, of lock-in, vendor lock-in, data portability, and shifting applications in the cloud? You know, how easy is that for, for, for companies to do? Um, Mark, have you got a, a brief point on that that you, you want to touch on? I mean, for us, uh, uh, I, I, this, the question scared me. I was like, oh, okay, we're, we're an AWS house at the moment. And uh, do I have to think about being a free, di free different cloud, porting it across all these different things? Uh, and then I spoke to some of our, uh, our architects. They said, calm down, calm down. Don't, you don't need to worry about this. We've got this built into how we've designed a lot of the things. And I said, well, how have you done that? And uh, a lot of the code, we've tried to use functions which are portable across different things. They've not ingrained too much into the tiny specifically to that thing. Understanding where your data is, is absolutely key to this. Now, I don't see necessarily a need for us to have that multi-cloud strategy at the moment, um, but how we've built the code inside then says that if we needed to, then we have similar types of tools that we could use. Mm. And we've got good knowledge of where our data and what our data stores do that we could, we could, be, we could look to port if we wanted to, but it's not, it's not a, it's not something that four years into our gestation we've really uh, thought long and hard about. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think for, for a lot of the established um, sort of uh, financial services firms, they, I think vendor locking is something they're really worried about because obviously everything changes so quickly. So almost by the time you've implemented that across a, a massive organization, it's already time to upgrade to something else. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a really live question. And, and Rob, on that final point there, you know, how are organizations overcoming those issues of lock-in, data portability, um, if you've got different applications, shifting, shifting the development of those in the cloud? Well, I think what's interesting is it goes back to something we started the conversation with, which is this whole journey towards the nirvana of having a golden data source, right? And I, I'm a bit worried that the cloud proposed data sources at the moment are just the next iteration of that whole fallacy, that we're going to get to something wonderful, highly scalable, and a single source of truth in your chosen cloud vendor, and it's the only place you'll ever need to put your data. Now, we know from history that's not true. And this is probably why the established financial services players are feeling this a little more acutely. It's because they have what I would call data baggage, right? They have data sources from the far past, from the near past, from the present. And they're still trying <laughs> to figure out how to get all of those to work together, even as some guy is coming and telling them we need to put all of their data into the cloud. Now, where the cloud is important is in terms of scalability, compute, all of the things that you need to be able to do to get the next generation of applications out to your clients as a financial services company. So I think what's important, again, from a purely data point of view, is taking on a platform that has some sort of semantic layer or semantic graph that is portable between cloud vendors, that still allows you to play your data where it lies and get value from your data, even if it's a legacy source, or even as you start to move into some of those new sources and bring it all together. But to make sure you can still take advantage of who's giving you the best deal in the cloud universe and make it so you don't have to have a five year project to move your data infrastructure from one to the other, especially for a lot of uh, financial services industries now who want to outsource their reporting and their analytics, right? They don't want to have to build their own tools to do that. They want to do it with some industry standard too. And that needs to fall in line with their compute strategy on the yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for that, Robert. And unfortunately, we're coming to time now. So um, I, I'd just like to, to say thank you so much to our panelists, um, Mark, John and Rob, for a fantastic discussion, um, really wide ranging. And as John mentioned, you know, there are loads of topics there that we could have spent uh, an extra half an hour on each. Um, but I think I think we've, we've covered uh, quite a lot of ground. Um, thank you too to MicroStrategy for sponsoring this FS Tech webinar. Um, we look forward to seeing you all for a future webinar. And um, be great to have you guys back. And uh, if you have any topics or suggestions you'd like to see covered in the audience, um, please contact us at FS Tech by visiting our website and clicking the contact us page. Uh, thanks so much, guys. It's been great having you on board. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah.